Hey folks, so today I'm going to be giving a lecture on generalizability and research designs. For video consumption, I'll break this up in kind of nice logical chunks. My hope is that this current setup, which is only one camera, but a separate, a separate mic, will be easier. Both on you and on me, we will find out. So yeah, let's let's get going. So generalizability. I talked about how there's this distinction between internal validity and external validity, and that I disagreed with the book's characterizations of this fuzzy idea of distinguishing between validity and reliability. This is where I really disagree with David Funder. I think his book is great, don't get me wrong. I mean, obviously I'm using the book, so I think it's pretty good. In case that was unclear, it's a very good book. But there are minor, minor things that I disagree with. I don't think there's this fuzzy distinction between reliability and validity. I could see there being a bit of a fuzziness with reliability and internal validity, but not so much the distinction between reliability and generalizability. So internal validity, which includes making sure your measure is consistent and is actually assessing what it's supposed to assess, all fall under internal. Versus external validity, which is all about generalizing and applying your finding beyond your study. Is your effect true outside of the little bubble that is your research study? Um, so in terms of the definition, I would say that generalizability is the degree to which a measurement or a result of an experiment or any kind of research study applies to other tests, other situations, other people. Does it apply to things beyond your specific study? This is actually a huge issue in psychology, even just looking at generalizability over research subjects. Many of you will have likely participated in the psychology research pool and a lot of research uses the research pool. And if we were in a class in person, I would ask you to kind of look around and notice that most of your classmates are um, college students. I mean, you all are college students. And in general, college students compared to the rest of the population are more affluent, they're more liberal. Even at a place like Wake Forest, they're more liberal. Um, they're healthier, they're younger, and they're less likely to belong to an ethnic minority. And there's also this weird quirk. It used to be like pre-1970s that most studies only used men. And it was a novelty or like a, almost a does this generalize question to uh, the ladies. If you recall from uh, the Milgram study, when they aggregated all those results, there was one condition of women, which implies strongly that every other condition was not women. So that has shifted. Now psychology is much more female dominated than it used to be. Um, this class is about 80% 80, 80 female, which is about in line what most, most classes are and most of the majors. So, so you have that aspect of just the distribution of like college students. There's an interesting tendency that women are more likely to volunteer for studies and when they volunteer, they are also more likely to show up. So this raises two questions about psych studies and the results we get from them. One, are women importantly different from men? And is that important difference why they are more likely to volunteer and show up. Next, we have to ask ourselves, are the men who volunteer and show up for these studies meaningfully different from the, from the other men, those that don't show up? It can be a really big problem if people differ in these groups systematically, and they tend to. In like a very glaring example, if you're interested in the study of punctuality, but you can only use participants who show up within five minutes of the expected start time, that's gonna have some problematic implications because 
the people who are less punctual are going to be excluded from your study because they didn't show up on time, but they're the kind of people that you're interested in studying. So all you have is a study of super punctual people versus slightly less super punctual people. Like it can really hinder your study if you have these kind of like systematic differences between those people who do participate in your study and those that don't. In an ideal world, you would want your study participants to be arbitrary if they were in the study or not, totally random, of whatever population you want to make your claims about had an equally likely chance of getting in the study. And even if we address the college versus no college, women versus men, showing up versus no showing up, there's another fundamental limitation of psychology research. It is not very ethnically or culturally diverse. So most research in psychology, most of the research that I will talk about, I've, I've made an active effort to broaden that as much as possible, but 80% of research is done on white middle-class college students as well as people who are weird. When I say weird, I mean W-E-I-R-D in all caps. It's an acronym. Weird is in Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic people. So beyond the United States, typically research studies look at members of the EU and Canada. A lot of studies, almost 80% of studies hit that area. Which is not everybody. That is not a huge por portion of the population. Yet it's 80% of psych studies. And that has some serious implications for what we can actually say about our studies. Now that's not to say that any study is incorrect. That is to say that we can't know if those findings apply to other groups beyond white college students. Now, as someone who actively participated in studies, actively, um, as many of you have and will, the nice perk of that is you know these studies are going to generalize to you because it's almost arbitrary whether you were in them or not. So I'm going to cut the video here for editing purposes so you can take a break. It's not going to look like it went anywhere because I didn't. I've, I've discovered that I can build in these nice little pauses for you guys.